over a number of years. The idea behind programming in this thesis over four talks is to enable an in-depth consideration of the terms of Sue Howell's argument and to provide the opportunity for engaged response. If you've not been able to attend the previous sessions, video documentation is available to be viewed on our website, and I believe Sue Howell will be giving a recap this evening. His presentation this week is titled A History of Negations, and after the presentation, he'll be joined by artist Diane Bauer to provide some immediate responses before opening up to questions from the audience. For those of you who haven't attended the previous talks, Sue Howe's writing and teaching addresses political economy, theory, and the axioms of contemporary art, and he has published widely on these subjects. He holds a readership in critical studies at Goldsmiths, where he is program co-director of the MFA of Fine Art. For the last academic year, Sue has been visiting fellow at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College, New York. And we're happy to have Diane Bauer with us as well. Uh, she's, an art, she's an artist originally from New York, but has been living in London and Berlin for the past four year, 14 years. She has had shows in London, Berlin, Busan, and amongst many others. She's currently working on a commission for the Socrates Sculpture Park in Queens. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, thanks for the intro, and again, thanks to our space for the opportunity to present these talks here. Um, and thanks to some of you who have been coming back for more. Uh, I'm, a few faces if you uh, I'm going to talk today for about 45 50 minutes, and then we'll have a QA and a and then, and then um, on the floor as well. And for those of you who haven't been here before, let me just recapitulate um, the, the terms of engagement of these talks, how they engage with contemporary art, and why why they do so. The primary concern of the talks are the conditions and logic by which the terms of contemporary art get the meaning, but also their operational effects. Um, in other words, what I'm interested in are the axioms of contemporary art. And two points. Firstly, that the issue here is, is to establish in the first place that contemporary art does have a logic, that it can be identified, and I think this is a counterintuitive claim to contemporary art. And secondly, that the terms of contemporary art are sometimes artworks, but not always and not necessarily so. Contemporary art is not just the art itself. Okay? Contemporary art is also the discourses and the institutional practices that constitute the habitus, if you want to call it that, of contemporary art. So the subject of these talks is not is art, not artworks, nor artists. Secondly, as a discussion of art's axioms, the claims made here are totalizing, and I accept the, the, the term totalizing, and they concern the dominant forms of the field. There are, of course, minor and other forms of art which aren't covered by the discourse, and they would be of interest, but I'm trying to address the dominant form, the prevalent form of contemporary art. And this being the week of the Venice Biennale, it seems as good as time as any other sort of art. And thirdly, that this is a theoretically led argument and demand on art. It's a, theory, it's a theoretically led argument and demand on art. Now, so for all of these reasons, these talks do not draw upon particular artworks, and they don't look to particular art for support of the argument or for counterexample. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain more about that in, later in today's talk. So the reasons, just to be clear, this comes out of a discussion with Richard Burkett from Artist Space after the last talk. The, the, the reasons to not talk about art is, is not motivated by the wish to ensure artists and art are not instrumentalized. Okay? So sometimes when people talk theoretically, there's a claim to not instrumentalize art and artists, so we kind of keep them at a distance and so on. That's not my reason to not talk about art. Rather, I want to keep the focus on the general terms and conditions for art, so as to establish the axioms and logic rather than get drawn into particular, particular claims or particular artworks, because I want to identify the global logic of art. And I want to do this, to be clear, I want to do this in order to instrumentalize art better. My interest long term is to instrumentalize art. So I'll start the talk. Right? In this talk, um, I'll quickly review the main conclusions from the last two talks, and I'll bring them together to identify a problem in establishing a comprehensive characterization of contemporary art. Okay? I, made a, I made one thing in the first talk, another thing in the second talk, and in this talk I'll bring them to the transcendence. Um, from that, I'll outline how and why this extreme, extremely specific logic of contemporary art is historically set in place. And finally, I'll propose some requirements for an art that steps outside of the limitations of contemporary art. Okay. 
Okay, and just a little warning, this will involve some tricky maneuvers and be a little bit convoluted, but um, I've got some diagrams that will help. Uh, and what we'll see, hopefully by the end of the talk, is that this other art than contemporary art, the art that steps outside of contemporary art, postulates the power of negation for art greater than anything contemporary art can propose or manage. Okay. That's, the, that's the goal. Get to a power of negation for art greater than contemporary art can manage. Is the microphone working okay? Yeah. Okay. It's sort of coming in out from here. Right. So the first talk, the claim of the first talk was that contemporary art observes what I called an anarcho-realist maxim. And what, what I meant by this was that contemporary art takes the present and history of art to not be real enough. It's too institutional to be what it really should be, for what art really should be. The standard form of this claim is that current and historical forms of art are too academic, too stuck up, too shallow, rule-bound, private, narcissistic, detached, formless, institutional, too constrained and too artificial to be true to art. So the current forms of art aren't the truth of art. Art as we have it, what I call actually existing art, is but a shortcoming of what art should be. And there's a certain sense in which we have to accept that art really is what it should be. Uh, and I'll call this condition the charge against the limitation of artificiality. So, current art is, is limited by its artificiality, and the anarcho-realist maxim makes a charge or an accusation against, contempt, against current art for that reason. And the artificial here is contrasted to the real, not to the natural. So anarcho-realism then is a charge against the limitation of artificiality. We want something truer, uh, less institutional, less stuck up, less false, less narcissistic and worse. That was the first talk. The second talk, the claim of the second talk, is that contemporary art is a mistake. In a very specific sense. The characteristic indeterminacy, the openness and hesitations, the uncertainty of meaning, the ambivalences and question asking without prescribed answers, all of these familiar characteristics of contemporary art. This indeterminacy is a mistaken identification for the non-unity of the present. Okay? So the present, this moment of time, the now, the contemporary, uh, does not, I, I, I claim, or I follow by Jew, I guess, it's saying that this is a multiple without identity, it doesn't have any, any coherent unity. Um, and the mistake of contemporary art is to presume that it's indeterminacy, the open-endedness of art, contemporary art as an aggregate form, but also per artwork, is mistaken for this non-unity of the present. Okay. That's the claim of the second talk. Predicated on this mistake, contemporary art purports to address the present because it, because it says that the open-endedness of contemporary art is, represents, symbolizes, uh, captures the uh, non-integrity or the disintegration of the present. Because it conflates these two things and identifies one for the other, Contemporary art purports to address the present, to be adequate to the present in which it takes place. But in fact, deliberately, it misses what is specific about the contemporary because it's stuck in a genre of indeterminacy. Because contemporary art assumes and proposes indeterminacy, it absence any limitation in material, because it's, it's, it avows indeterminacy, it doesn't get stuck on, it, it absence any limitation in material, media, subject matter, form, presentation, or other production, because we know very well, contemporary art can take any media form and the rest of it. Um, and also, it's, it's absence any limitations in production, exhibition, or distribution formats. And this seems to be clear. It absence definition of content, definition of content, not content, the definition of content, the definition of addressee, or criteria, which is another way of saying, altogether, contemporary art has no identity. And the claim of this talk is that it does. So contemporary art's belief, if you want to attribute belief to uh, general form, culture, contemporary belief is that it has no identity, I claim that it does. We can, we can identify it, and that's in a way the principal task of these talks. Okay? Yet, although it has no identity, it does have definite characteristics, or rather indefinite characteristics. And these indefinite characteristics do provide common features, not least rhetorically. It's indeterminate. Contemporary art is indeterminate. Firstly, in its mode of address, it's open enough to allow open interpretation. You go up to an artwork, and so if I ask you, well, what do you think? What do you make of this? Okay. Uh, it doesn't close down meaning. It's a probing question asking without resolution. And if you were here at the last talk, you remember the descriptions by 
Yuyana Rebentish and Terry Smith, which kind of gave more elaborate versions of this claim. It's also indeterminate, contemporary is indeterminate to address C. It's for anyone at all. Who it addresses is anonymous and unspecific. You can be anyone and get something from the author. Contemporary art, specifically contemporary art, uh, sets up a condition such that it can be taken up by anyone. You're free of sociological determination in the encounter with the artwork in contemporary art. And thirdly, contemporary art is indeterminate in its criteria. The apologies for the extra space between the press and criteria. It's independent criteria, there are no common standards or universal criteria for contemporary art. You're, up, you're on your own in understanding what to do with the art. You can't appeal to external authorities to guide you. Each work is to be taken in its singularity and in the singularity of the experience of the art. So though it seems to take form as a genre in its common indeterminacy, it's also the case that contemporary art cannot be a genre because it tarries with all genres. It doesn't have an identifiable genre. Okay. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it has a generic commonality in its indeterminacy, but it cannot be a genre of art. So the kind of quick way to get out of this problem is to call contemporary art a meta-genre without identity. This is another formulation for contemporary art as an art of indeterminacy, but an aggregate totalizing level rather than per art level. Okay, so the claims around indeterminacy here uh, uh, operate per artwork, but my claim is also that they operate for contemporary art at a total and aggregate level, which is the point at which it's a meta genre without identity. And this is another formulation of contemporary art, uh, as a, sorry, uh, just read that, as an, ag at an aggregate totalizing level. Now the argument of the last talk was that contemporary art is a metagenre of identity, of indeterminacy, but that is not the absence of unity, that is not the absence of unity of the present. Okay? So the contemporary qua time, the present, not having any uh, unity or common horizon, uh, cannot be identified with this metagenre of indeterminacy, and I'll speak more about that later. If we do take, this is the mistake of contemporary art, to conflate the meta-genre with either identity that it is as a practice, to conflate that and identify that with the, with the, uh, with the present as not having a, 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 a horizon or, or a, a unity or an integrity to it. Contemporary art conflates the two. Okay? It says that its openness, contemporary art's openness, is adequate to and is the correct response to the openness uh, non-identity of the present. That the, that the present is incoherent, it's inconsistent, and contemporary art captures that inconsistency. So predicated, uh, assuming that contemporary art is adequate to contemporary, is to, is to take contemporary art, sorry, it's a previous slide, Uh, okay. If, if we assume that contemporary art uh, is adequate to the contemporary, as contemporary art does, contemporary art is then a fetish for the present. Okay? And we understand this, this is a kind of common enough uh, moment. It's precisely to go to something like Venice or an opening uh, and say, what's going on now? What is the now? Let's look at art to find out. Okay. The assumption being that art does speak to the now and sort of somehow is adequate to the but as a fetish of the present, contemporary art, in fact, blocks, this is the kind of standard formulation of fetish, contemporary art blocks and misdirects attention from the present itself. So it claims to address the present, but it slides away from the present. Contemporary art, in fact, gets in the way of the real, the present as the real, as it seeks to make a claim on it. Okay? And that's the kind of smart and cunning move of contemporary art. It makes a claim to speak to the real, but in fact, it gets in the way, it blocks blocks access to the real. Now let's call this condition contemporary art's metageneric limitation. By this I simply mean that contemporary art is a genre of indeterminacy that gets in the way of the present, of addressing the present. Now, these are the two conditions of contemporary art. The counter demand being made in these talks 
which is the call for an exit from contemporary art, is that art better addresses and is better entangled with the present in a determinate and specific complexity. And I'll come to that in the next talk. For the moment, what we can say is that contemporary art is defined here, is here defined and identified by these two limitations. Firstly, that it observes the maximum of anarcho-realism, and secondly, that it is a metagenre of identity of indeterminacy. Okay? Which is to say that it is conditioned by the charge against the limitation of artificiality, the anarcho-realist complaint, and simultaneously it's identified by a metagenre limitation. So the, it, that's, that's the kind of basic picture, the two, the two constraints, the two limitations of contemporary art. Anarcho-realism complains about art, art's artificiality, the mistake of contemporary art, that it thinks it's about the present, it captures the present, it's adequate to the present, but it's not, is the metagenetic limitation. Okay, those are the two basic points, and they're fundamental to the rest of the talk, so it's, it's clear that, uh, it's important that we're clear about those two those two basic claims. So the task now is to bring these two, uh, th these two elements together, these two claims together. If, if the claim to exit contemporary art is to be at all convincing, it needs a comprehensive account of this other art, this exit contemporary art. Which means that the two determinations of contemporary art identified here have to be cogently synthesized. Okay, we've got to make sense of these two things together. The question then is whether their identification of contemporary art as an arco realist is coherent with this identification of being metagenerically limited. And these are two so far separate claims, but obviously since they're both contemporary art, any comprehensive account of contemporary art, which is necessary to get out of it, has to bring these two, these two determinations, synthesize these two determinations, make them coherent with one another. And it's a particularly pressing problem because these two characteristics, in fact, contradict one another. The drama here is that the charge against metagenetic limitation, contemporary metagenetic, the charge that it, it, it doesn't in fact speak to the present, but is only a fetish for the present, this is exactly the same as the charge against the limitation of artificiality. As a fetish for the present, contemporary art is artificial, okay, which is the anarcho-realist complaint. So the complaint against contemporary art's met metagenetic limitation is precisely that art is inadequate to its contemporaneity and is to be superseded by an art that is adequate to the present. Okay, so my, my, my second characterization, contemporary art is a mistake, is in fact an anarcho-realist complaint. Because I'm saying art should be more adequate to the present, but that's what anarcho-realism says, oh, art at the moment, it doesn't do the job well enough, we need an art that's more real, more true, more adequate to whatever condition for me in the present. But this demand, this anarcho-realist demand, is exactly a contemporary art demand. It's exactly the maximum of anarcho-realism, which also characterizes contemporary art. So the complaint against contemporary art being a fetish for the present is an anarcho-realist demand, but that's contemporary art itself. Okay. So the complaint about contemporary art's inadequacy to the present repeats contemporary art. In other words, if we bring, if we try and synthesize these two, these two, character, two characterizations of contemporary art, try and bring them together, we're back in contemporary art. A declared exit from contemporary art is then, in fact, just a diversion, a detour for reinstating contemporary art. Contemporary art is cleverer than either characterization. And that makes me sound. <laughs> So there's a problem. But to see how to get past this problem and to find a track for this exit from contemporary art and also what that exit would require of art for those who wish to pursue it, uh, I'm going to quickly jump cut now to Terry Lee Duke's Can't After Duchamp, published in 1998. I think it's almost still as a as a global characterization, a total picture of contemporary art, as a theory of contemporary art. The Duke presents, I think, one of the most convincing total cases on what contemporary art is and how it is. Okay. 
And it does so in relation to the history of modern art. So the advantage of the dude's argument and sort of just quickly, um, quickly uh, summarizing it here is that we'll be able to place this claim for an exit from contemporary art in a history of modern to contemporary art. It also gives us a more nuanced picture of contemporary art, which, we need to, which is needed to deal with the apparent incoherence in the identifications of contemporary art that we've run into. Okay. So the problem that I've run into, I think, to do this account, which I think is, is a total account of contemporary art. Uh, and one of the few people who's prepared to risk such a total account uh, also gives us access. So it gives us a, a, a method for thinking, a concept, actually, for thinking about what we have. In broad outline, <coughs> to do this argument, we can't have to show just to give you some of the main claims of the book. The do uh, after Duchamp is devoted to specifying the Duchampian radicalization of art with the ready made. Uh, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes saying what to do says, but it's about 80 pages that I'm summarizing, so I'm saving your time. Unless you've already read it, of course. Uh, and apologies to those of you here from CCS, where we spent four weeks looking at this book. Because <laughs> I can do it in about 10 15 minutes. <laughs> now, having a step All right, so Kant of Duchamp is devoted to specifying the Duchampian radicalization through the ready made. And for Dedeur, what Duchamp does with the ready made is obliterate the ontological and aesthetic difference between art and non art. Okay? So, ready made takes this non art, declares it art, but also keeps it going as non art. It continues to be a problem. It sticks in the throat of art because it's, it, it's, it's, it obliterates a difference, an ontological and aesthetic difference between art and non-art. As we know, after, du, after Duchamp, after the ready-made, art can be anything and everything on the basis of a decision or a designation, what the Duke calls a feeling. Art is nothing in particular. You don't have to make it, you just have to nominate it, because it is only, so art is nothing in particular because it is only particular. Okay, with the ready-made, the first claim is that there is no concept of art. Art is only its particularities, which is still, I think, the prevalent sense of, of contemporary art since modernism. For De Deux, the ready-made is the definitive work of contemporary art because it is anti-definitive. It belies all necessity, all essence, definition, or categorization of art. Art is, internally, is an internally heterogeneous organism since the ready-made. Well, let's be clear. Not since the ready-made itself, but since the ready-made became the, the paradigm for contemporary art, which was in the 60s. Okay, so the ready-made uh, happens in the 10s, the 1910s. Um, forgotten about, neglected, until the breakdown of modernism in the 60s, 50s, 60s. And then it comes to the words, the paradigm for contemporary art. Uh, and still is. Art is an internally heterogeneous corpus. It doesn't have any definition. Each work of art is distinct to every other work of art. There are, no, there are no objective determinations of contemporary art, no concept, no theory of art. What counts as art is determined by the subjective experience of it in relation to an idea of art. But this is all to do, I'm just summarizing, so I don't particularly need to go through, through the argument. I will come back to some of this later on. The sum, the sum point of Dudeau's argument is Duchamp's negation of art and non-art presents a new condition, contemporary art. So the ready-made does contemporary art about 50 years before contemporary art. And of course couldn't be recognized as contemporary art at the time in this meta-generic way, but only as a specific problem to do with the, with the art ratio of the 19th, 13th, 13th. Now, de Deux's main task in, in the book is to settle accounts with all rivals, and he does this very jealously around the ready mode. He presents theories of art from anthropology, sociology, philosophy, art history. But in all of these, the most salient figure for the discussion of today is that of the historian of the avant-garde. De Deux says this about two of the historian. He says, you, you the historian of the avant-garde, you are the historian of the becoming of art, of the very movement through which art is produced, progresses in its historical unfolding. You are not dealing with a given corpus, so it's not art history in the traditional sense. Here's a corpus of art, and let's just look at the internal stylizations and 
the period at which this stylization happens. So an avant-garde historian is interested in the moves of one artifact to another artifact. Okay. With a problematized consensus. You, espouse, you, the historian of the avant-garde, espouse a philosophy of history for which there is no definition of art except the historical process through which art negates itself, through which art negates itself, and comes to terms with its own negation. So how do you move from one style, one moment of art to the avant-garde? The avant-garde negates the current dominant form of art and produces another moment of art, which may or may not then become a consensus, but the historian of the avant-garde will look at those constant um, iterations, those constant re-negations, um, and that produces the history of art. So the history of art is a history of negations for the historian of the art. This process, to do continues, does not have an essence for its ground. Rather, it has struggled for its motive. When you call this process art, you mean that we, humans, don't agree about what art is. Because what we're interested in is exactly the negation of art from one moment to another. It's exactly the non-agreement, the dissensus, the non-consensus of art, the non-agreement that this is art, that something else should be art, that art happens through the art. We struggle, we need to struggle for what art should be. So the historian of the Alcatra de Deux is committed then to an art without identity. Art is generating negotiations or negations of what art was and how it can be identified. As such, the historian of the avant-garde is closer to the art critic, who does exactly that. Or the historian who engages with the present, as the Deux says in Finland. Or even the curator, who says, this is what art should be, not that. Or the artist who is motivated by what passes for politics in the art field now and looks to, do, to, to, to uh, make an art adequate to such a politics or to the present to, in negation of an art that doesn't do it. And these are, of course, soft Muthian claims of social dissensus or agonism. So it seems to me an interesting move, an agonism, and the entire yeah, agonism uh, and dissens social, social dissensus. Uh, sort of follows, follows or belongs to this history of the avant-garde. What is important in this characterization, the globally important thing is characterization, is that the engine of this history of the avant-garde is negation. But for Deleuze, negation is not enough. The ready-made, so he's, he's critiquing the historian of the avant-garde, negation is not enough. The ready-made supersedes any distinction between art and its negation because it is the overcoming of the art non art distinction. Okay? So if you have art and you negate it, you go to non art dialogue, would be the typical example. Capra would be the follow through. You would go to non art. But if the ready made overcomes the art non art distinction, it's too late for negation. Okay? The historian of the art guard has missed the boat that Duchamp set sail from, from France to America. <laughs> the, history of the, the history of art as a history of negations, is itself over. It's negated. Okay? So the history of avant-gardism culminates in and retires with the ready-made. <laughs> Even if it took for 50 years for it to be understood as the key moment in the transformation of art from avant-garde modernism, from avant -garde modernism to contemporary art. Okay, I'm actually quite pleased with this. <laughs> Contemporary art, then, is the internalization of the history of avant-gardism. I can come back to that slide in the questions if you want. <laughs> Enjoy. Contemporary art is the internalization of the history of avant-gardism as the premise for art. Any negation of contemporary art is perpetuation of contemporary art. The, obliter the obliteration of the overcoming of the art non art means that if you negate whatever art is now, you go into non-art. But Duchamp's already done that, that's the condition of contemporary art, so you have more contemporary art. If you try to negate contemporary art, you have more contemporary art. And we all know this. So all the desperate attempts to get out of contemporary art by negating it produce more contemporary art. And you end up with these kind of um, terrible, uh, um, sort of masochistic attempts to exit contemporary art and failing to do so. Uh, in a way, culminating with Tanya Bagheri's pulling the gun. 
the self and the self rushing to that Venice, I think two Venices, a few Venices. Um, but, but there are lots of examples of this, this kind of bad faith moment of exiting contemporary art. It's limited, you try and get out of it by, by trying to do something that's not contemporary art. Everyone says, fantastic, all contemporary art. And you go, well, thanks for the cash, but this is appalling. I'm appalling faith in my work. Whether you're an artist or a poet or a writer. But this is all anarcho realism, of course. But there's anarcho realism, the maxim of anarcho realism, to do something more real, more true, more authentic than art as it is now, to negate contemporary art, maintains contemporary art. It maintains contemporary art as a perpetuation of this modernist legacy and the sense that art has a history and attraction beyond itself. Okay? So anarcho realism keeps that sense in place, but in, in, in inaugurating that and operationalizing that through art, it perpetuates contemporary art. Which is why Dan Graham can say it and say art as it is now is not good enough and be highly lauded as a critical contemporary artist. <coughs> lauded and applauded as a critical contemporary artist by denigrating art as it is now. So in this logic, contemporary art continues with its imperative of negation but now affirms art in its history and is a kind of conservatism. So this effort to get out of, to escape, this is the moment of escape I was trying to speak about in the first talk. This effort to escape contemporary art is in fact a kind of conservatism. It just keeps the contemporary art thing going because of the ready-made. The ready-made sets up the contemporary art field as a dialectic, essentially. Um, maybe the Deux's next big book will be called Hegel after two shots. What happens in and as art after the ready then? What happens when art has no definition and not even a history of negativity to orient it? What happens for the Deux is the love of art. He says, you need no theory of art to love art. You are in love with this or that world. You're in love with this or that work. You certainly, and certainly with more than one at a time, more than one and a half at a time, but not with all the work. So you have criteria, you make judgments. All you have for knowledge is your own certitude. You don't need to go to art school. And all you have for certitude is your own feeling. You don't need to go to school at all. If at this point, says Dudu, if at this point someone asks you to define art, it is with your taste and your personal feelings that you will answer. You will say, pointing a finger at your favorite works, art is this and this and that. If you look at it, you have been asked for a definition, but since you have only your feelings as a guide, you feel entitled, you don't feel entitled to generalize. Which is why to do it, you cannot have a totalizing theory of art. So in place of the theory, you give examples. Each of them you baptize with the name art one by one. The phrase, this is art, is the expression of your judgment arising case by case. That's his, that's his core theory of art, contemporary art. Now there are several corollaries to this which I'm going to run through quite quickly, which will explain the sort of outline definition I gave earlier. The judgment being made is not whether art is good or bad. After all, what would be the valid criteria for all of us to know which art is good and which art is bad? And it's not a judgment of like or dislike. It's not, I like this work or I don't like this work. The judgment is, this is art. This is art. It's a judgment of designation, of nomination, not taste. Secondly, it's made on the basis of a subjectively <coughs> feeling, what a dirt vehicle's love but then pushes into the philosophical domain by calling it an aesthetic judgment. And after all, the Deux's book is called Kant after Duchamp, which means the, the Kant after the third critique. Thirdly, this is not, despite being a judgment of feeling, it's not merely an anecdotal or personal judgment, since it takes place either in accordance with what, either in accordance with what others call art, museums, galleries, history or culture, artist space, the ISP, 
or sometimes with not with what other people call art. And when it's not in accordance with what other people call art, it's dissensus and disquiet, which was Duchamp's move. Okay? So the judgment then is publicly contestable. It's not just an anecdotal judgment. Your feelings are public feelings when you say that this is not. So I guess the schema is something like this. Somebody says, what do you call art? You say, this is art. You do that on the basis of feeling, uh, but you designate it to others. You say, this is art for me and for others. And some people will say, yeah, because we all agree to art. The Manning or Duchamp. Or some people will say, is it? Really? And then that would be the most consensus. And that's the kind of perfect fantasy moment for the public presentation of art that we all go around having our conversations and, and sort of uh, acting out the little publics in front of the artwork through, through the questions of, is it art? What is art? How is it art? What does the art give us to talk about? For everyone then, because it's about everyone's personal judgment, for everyone, art is everything I call art. And what's important about this phrase with Duchamp is the first mention of art is the genre, and the second one is little art, little art. Little art. Art is everything I call art. All the this is art amounts to capital A art, the genre of art. The generic term art is only the aggregate, the collection, without summation or conclusion of all the cases, this is art. And as such, it is in part consensual because others also recognize some of the things that you call art in total, the aggregate art and also dissensual. Others do not make some of the, some of the same judgment. Some of the things you call art, other people call art. <coughs> Fifth, art continues to be transmitted only by and as this judgment. So every time I say this is art, even if it's a judgment, a dissensual judgment, this is a transmission of art. It perpetuates art. It has a history and a tradition that can never be taken for granted. Your judgments are never secure. And it provides no rule for the judgment. So we're into the count of the third critique of uh, reflexive judgment, which also calls on the first critique. But since art is then a noun without intrinsic meaning or definition, because we can't predict or we can't define what we will call art, this is up to a subjective feeling, it's a noun without intrinsic meaning or definition, yet it has a referent only by the performative nomination this is art, which have no criteria, art is a proper name. It is a name that cannot be rationally justified because it is only a personal feeling cast into the form of a predicative proposition. This is, this is the do from page 53. He says, um, the, the, the judgment this is art is only a personal feeling cast into the form of a predic predicative proposition, this is art, with a claim to conceptual objectivity. So you make the claim on the basis of objective feeling. When you say this is art, you refer to the genre of art, and this is about conceptual objectivity. But, it, but the, the judgment itself always falls short of what contributes to that conceptual objectivity. We can speak a bit more questions if you want more details about why it's a proper name rather than just a noun. Basically, it has it has no uh, it has no definition, no consistency. So, for example, the proper name Michael. There's no definition to gather all the Michaels, it's just by virtue of them all being baptized, if you like, called Michael, that they all get, they all have the same name. There's no definition or uh, intrinsic, intrinsic reason for them to be called Michael. Seventh, the seventh uh, moment of this, um, I'm in a way more substantial for the concerns here, making the nomination this is art on a case-by-case -case basis means that there need be no order of coherence as regards what art is or will be for any, anyone in particular or in Africa. All the Michaels don't add up to a kind of a concept of Michaels. There's no, there's no order of coherence to all Michaels. I get them all in a room, they'll say, why the hell am I here? What have I got with these people? Nothing in common apart from them. If they had something in common, then they would constitute a noun, a, a proper noun Michael. But they constitute, they're gathered by the name. And the same for art. Apologies to anybody's So the judgment this is art 
the judgments rather, the judgments that is art are without criteria, but only judgments of recognition or designation, what can of course refer to judgments. There is no definition or concept, no theory of art, only instances, only cases of art. There is a feeling of art that is not just personal sentiment, but which registers an idea of art. Okay? So kind of follow through Kant a bit more in this. Um, the concept would be, would give a definition of art. We can't have a definition. We just have a gathering of instances of art. And Kant's name for that is an idea. Okay? The idea of art is instantiated in all cases um, by, the by the judgment and nominations this is art. An idea, uh, how to put this, the, the, the nomination this is art is the recognition of art in principle, of the principle of art. Okay? Not the concept, but the principle of art. It's not definitive. And this is what sets up the structure of a maxim. Okay? So the maxim is, art is not real enough, it's not anarchic enough, but it's still a kind of art. It operates according to a principle of greater anarchy, greater reality. There's an idea of anarchy or an idea of reality which kind of mobilizes that maximum of anarcho-realism. And then the last point from, from the two is that this dissensual judgment, the dissensual judgment, remember some of the consensual will agree this is art, a Duchamp or a man or something like this, um, but the dissensual judgment this is art, belonging to art in general without legitimation, is what Duchamp, what the two calls the weakest link in the chain of the transmission of the name art. Okay, and it's the weakest link because it has no established attachments or precursors. So when you say this is art, you say, well, is it? How? Why do we know? Why do you say that? Um, in fact, you wouldn't be able to justify it apart from to say, I feel this is art. Okay? But insofar as you cannot make any objective claims to it, it's a weak link in the transmission of the name art. Because somebody could just say, no, it's not. And the consensus would say, no, it's not, and it would be sidelined or left out of the, the canonizing history of art. So the dissensual judgment was weak, necessarily, which is also the current interest in dissensus in the art field. The dissensual judgment, this is art, presents the fact. Oh, I've lost this uh, the dissensual judgment, this is art, presents the fact that it is but an aesthetic judgment, a sentimental universal judgment. And it presents it more nakedly. I have no backup for this judgment. And lets that fact be more apparently apprehended. Why do you call this art? You don't give any reasons. But at, at that point of vulnerability, that's the indication that this is a dissensual judgment. It cannot be objectively agreed to. There is no consensus around it. We cannot automatically subscribe. At least if you say around a man A, this is art, it's a big deal. <laughs> you're, not, you're not hurting it when you say that. If you say it around something, that is not commonly recognized art, as art, then, then it's a vulnerable judgment. But what you then reveal by that vulnerability, if you want, um, is, is that it's only an aesthetic judgment based on feeling. Okay? And, and so the dissensual judgment reveals that it's an aesthetic judgment more nakedly. But in doing that, the Dirt then says the tradition you belong to in making these judgments, these nominations, this is art, is no different tradition from what others call the avant-garde. But this is not an avant-garde with predicated on negation. This is an avant-garde predicated on aesthetic judgment and a dissensus from the history of art. And this, I think, is the moment uh, of Ranciere dissensus, distinct to Lucian dissensus. What is critical, that's, that's the kind of detailed, uh, the detail of that line of the Deux, the Deux's argument, what's critical to draw from it is that the condition of art is that it is a proper name and that this is artistic intervention in contemporary art. You don't have to make anything, you don't have to curate anything, you just have to name stuff art. At the point at which you do it dissensually, this is a point of artistic intervention. And, and it can't be nominated by anyone equally. Nominated by an artist, in fact what artists do is name stuff art and then make it in order to kind of back up the name. That's actually what art is in contemporary art. Artists are making, making art in order to back up the, the, the judgment, this is art. Sometimes consensually, sometimes not. 
but it's also done by the viewer. And Duchamp, uh, the Deux's main figure is the viewer of art. Actually, it's not. The main figure is the collector. Because collectors do this all the time. So if there's a complaint about the, 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 the uh, what's it called, the, uh, the vapid collector who just goes around and buys stuff because they like it. So, goes into exhibition, galleries or attendant is going blah, 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 this in history, this concept. Collector says, whatever, whatever, they love it. This is great, this is art. I'm going to take it. That's aesthetic judgment. You know, you know to do the, um, that collector has been Duchamp here. That collector is the figure of contemporary art. But it's also done by the critic, who of course makes this move, and by the curator. These judgments, these judgments are not negations of the name of art, but are transmissions. So the question is why De Deux says that this judgment is, uh, I should have had a slide of it, why he says the judgment is no different from what others call the avant garde, although it does not belong to the history, the his, it does not belong to the history of negation, that is the history of the avant garde. Unlike earlier moments of avant gardeism, what negation there is in the dissensual judgment is not art's undoing. Okay? If you remember the history of the avant garde, we went to non art in order to get away from and out of art as it is. Okay? But with dissensual judgment, contemporary art, when you make the dissensual judgment, you don't get out of art, you get reincorporated, or you, 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 you replay, you reiterate art. And so the dissensual judgment is a moment of growth, it's an inflation, it's a growth mechanism for art, a perpetuation, a continuation, a transmission of art. And so, though dissensus is the true naked moment of judgment, when you know you're making your own judgments on what art is on the basis of your feeling without relying on conventions, the judgment, this is art, in, is in any case the proliferation of new, other, more things that get called art. Okay? This reiterates the point that it's too late for the non art moment of art as a contemporary art. The dissensual judgment, even the dissensual judgment, this is art, and he says, is it? Well, actually, that's a moment of art. That's aesthetic judgment at its most naked. But that's what art is in Duchamp did moment. That's what Duchamp did with the ready mode. So every time you make a dissensual judgment, you repeat Duchamp's gesture with the ready mode at the Armour Show in 1930. You're a true inheritor. When somebody says, your judgment's a crap. You say, no, this is art, I feel it. Okay? But that, that's a perpetuation of art. That's a, that's a continuation and an entrenchment of contemporary art. <coughs> You're just making more art, more contemporary art. This judgment, this is art, is a proliferation of differences. And that's what contemporary art is. A proliferation of differences that perpetuate art. We can put this another way. Since the distensial judgment, the judgment, this is art, perpetuates art, but is not of the history of negations, we can say contemporary art is a post-negational art. And of course, this is why contemporary art cannot seriously contest injustices. If you want to contest an injustice, you negate the injustice. If contemporary art is a post-negational art, because a lot of things produce dissensuses, dissensi, I don't know, dissensuses, that uh, perpetuate art, it cannot negate. So when it's confronted with an injustice and claims to speak to it or address it, in fact it just produces the dissensus to it, but doesn't negate it. It cannot contend with injustice, but only slide away from it in a, in a claim for greater indeterminacy as a moment of emancipation freedom in relationship to the injustice, to the injustice. There are two indexes of this post negational condition. Firstly, Contemporary art has no intrinsic direction, but only an interminable continuation. It's the final word in art. I said this last week in relationship to the contemporaneity of art. Contemporary art has no direction, but only an interminable proliferation and a heterogeneous inflation of art. Uh, and if you want later on, 
I'll break my own embargo on looking at particular artworks, and we could have a visit to Contemporary Art Daily to prove this point. The second corollary, the second index of this post negation condition, is that the rhetoric and generic conventions of contemporary art as an open-ended question asking and then and then determinacy, the indeterminacy of contemporary art, what do you make of the piece, what do you say, what are your judgments on it, what should we talk about? All of this stylizes and preempts the criteriallessness of the post-negation art, which can only invite the judgment this is art rather than prescribe it or proscribe it. Okay. So the claim here is that what happens in the style of contemporary art as we have it is art the indeterminacy of contemporary art is simply the artwork saying I don't pressure you to do anything. I simply invite your judgment. This is art. Okay. Contemporary art stylizes, the, through its indeterminacy, stylizes post-negation post art. It, it invites the judgment. This is art without prescribing, without proscribing. So this, and, and I think it's pretty quite interesting to look at contemporary art daily for one instance to to kind of solidify this. But I think. You can probably gather from your experiences going around galleries, uh, if not up to now, but from now, that when you go up to an artwork, the question is, well, what do you do with it, right? So the artwork is stylized precisely the negotiation and indeterminacy, which wants you to say, this is art. It sets up an invitation to do that. It preempts the, cri the criterianess of judgment. So what it does, it sets up, you're making the judgment, this is art, without criteria, by certain stylistic tricks and configurations. Basically, it won't be determinate about anything at all. Maybe media, it's a painting, or it's a sculpture, it's an installation. Maybe that, but not much else. In order to say, what is your judgment? Is this art? So this condition is internalized. And insofar as contemporary art follows that style, it's doing post-negation art. It's, of course we know this because art is now only the proliferation of differences without positive and negative term. Maybe sometimes consensual, uh, mostly consensual, maybe sometimes consensual, let's hope so. And it seems that the census is the last word in what we might call critical art. So that's the second moment, and I did, the, I did that quite sort of, um, you might think detailed, in fact extremely sketchy account of De Deux in order to come back to the problem of the contradiction between the two modes of contemporary art that I had at the beginning. This genealogy, more accurately, an archaeology of contemporary art, in particular about the absorption of negation as a motor of contemporary art, qua dissensual judgment. This genealogy of contemporary art uh, provides the basis upon which we can return to the question of whether the exit from contemporary art, which is only a proposition at this moment of time, this exit is only a detour in its perpetuation. Okay. The point that I came back to, which was if, if we try and critique art for not being really contemporary or not being adequate to the present, we do an algorithm of the back in contemporary art. Uh, it seems I've gone through this stuff around Dudu in order to kind of come back and be able to address, address that, uh, that apparent contradiction or that dialectical um, uh, incorporation better. And also to ascertain what the exit in fact is, what, what traits uh, are required to be observed in order to exit contemporary art. Which means an exit from all of this post negation stuff. Okay, so a quick reminder of, of the problem. The exit from contemporary art has to be an exit from both the charge against the limitation of artificiality, which is the anarcho rigorous moment, and also uh, an exit from metageneric limitation, the mistake that is contemporary art. Both of these determinations, it seems to me, can be framed in terms of Dedeux's de de archaeology of art, uh, an, an art which is ordered by the Duchamp singularity. But it's also a disorder, a disorder singularity, because art has no order criteria. Okay. Firstly, what we can see is the metageneric limitation is a consequence of the conversion of avant-garde negation into a proliferation of criteria as judgment. 
Okay. So what the DERF does with the with the with the, with the ready-made is to say uh, art and non-art are the same thing. The ready-made and absorbs negation of art into art and gets rid of any criteria for judgment. It's a proliferation of differences in indeterminacy without negation. Okay. It's a genre. It's rather it's a meta genre. It's not a genre because that would produce a non-genre. So you're back into this. Okay. So metagenetic limitation is precisely the absorption of avant-garde negation into contemporary art, into art as contemporary art. The second, the second moment, the, the second moment, the anarcho-realist moment, is a residue or a shadow of avant-garde negation within contemporary art. What anarcho-realism does, the maximum of anarcho-realism is internal contemporary art. It says. Contemporary art is not real enough. We need to get past it, which is the moment of avant-garde negation. But this happens within contemporary art. So the maximum of anarcho-realism is a residue, a shadow, a leftover, if you want, a uh, husk of avant-gardeism within contemporary art. It doesn't look to negate art or start from the outside of art, but to push art towards becoming more real, more sincere, and so on. Which is why Dan Graham and others who do this kind of stuff probably imagine themselves to be inheritors of an avant-garde within contemporary art. <clears throat> so both, both uh, characterizations of the problems with contemporary art, the limitations of contemporary art, I think can be explained as forms of um, this history of negation, of avant-garde negation being incorporated into contemporary art. Now the problem of incoherence, or the internal contradiction we ran into, in organizing an exit from contemporary art was that the charge against contemporary art cannot in fact face up to the contemporary cannot in fact face up to the contemporary that this is an anarcho realist charge. Okay. So, so the complaint against metageneric limitation that contemporary art is not adequate to the present this is a charge made by art. This is a typically an art realist moment. Okay. So we're in this, we're in this condition. <laughs> art needs to break out, the, the complaint against the inadequacy of art to the present is that art needs to break out of its metagenetic misidentification of the contemporary in order to address the present as such. Okay? And this is, in a way, an art realism. It's exactly an attempt to sort of negate art as it is now, not to have a better, more adequate art, which is a kind of negation of art within art itself. Yet, and this is the convoluted bit of the art, okay, so um, I'll, I'll do this and we'll probably return to it in the questions. In the terms of the Deux's archaeology of contemporary art, though the charge for an art adequate to the present, as it would uh, Okay, though the charge for an art adequate to the present as it is would seem to be the distensual nomination this is art, right? So you get out of, say, art is not the present, we need to have art this. This, this would seem to be the distensual moment. We say this is art, this is really art adequate to the contemporary. And, and because it's a distensual judgment, it perpetuates contemporary art. In fact, the accusation, the charge against art's inadequacy to the present, that it's a fetish for the contemporary, not really the contemporary, this is a charge against the conditions of contemporary art. It does not look to designate something else as art, the the, the, the Deux in the moment, as is art, right? It does not look to designate something else as art, but to negate contemporary art's metagenetic limitation. Okay? So the anarcho real demand tries to knock out the limitation, the metagenetic limitation of contemporary art, by making it a claim for the contemporary, for the present. Okay? It's not saying this is another moment of art. This is, it's not saying this is art, it's saying that there is a limitation of contemporary art. It's a theoretical claim. Right? So that's the first step. The second step, because that limitation is constituted, the limitation, the metagenic limitation, is constituted by the incorporation of negation into art, the Duchampian overcoming of 
And negation gets incorporated into contemporary art as contemporary art's internal motive, the production of another judgment. This is art. So the anarcho realist charge against contemporary art's misapprehension of contemporary is then a negation of the incorporation of negation into art. This, this took a lot of work to get to this too. <laughs> Let's do it again, right? The anarcho realist charge against contemporary art's misapprehension of contemporary which is contemporary art, you are but a fetish for the present, you're not really the present, that this charge is a negation against contemporary art. But what is that? It's a negation against, it's a negation of the incorporation of negation into contemporary art. It's a, it's a negation of the Duchampian conversion of avant-gardism into contemporary art. So it's a kind of avant-garde plea beyond the Duchampian moment, and surpassing the Duchampian moment. Uh, and this is the model of gloves that we see here. Okay. You can sort of schematize it this way. The, the, the charge against um, metagenetic limitation of art is a charge against art's incorporation of negation as a perpetuation. It is a charge made in the name of a denegation of art. What it says is that Duchamp singularity must be overcome. It says, let's get out of Duchamp. So that's, that's, the, that's the way to deal with the problem of metageneric limitation. And now the problem is dealing with the narco realism. So the charge against the narco realism that anarcharism posits a real of art to be elsewhere than here and now, elsewhere than the present, and its institutions, this charge itself reiterates the one against contemporary art's metagenetic limitation in other terms. Okay. So contemporary art, contemporary art as we saw, I, I don't really know if these pictures work or not, they seem to sort of stabilize, stabilize the logics enough to get to the next picture. Contemporary art, as we saw, mistakes its own generic, its own, this is the fetish one, okay? Contemporary art mistakes its own generic conventions, indeterminacy primarily, mistakes indeterminacy for the inconsistency and incoherence of the present. Contemporary art is a fetish for the present, not really the present itself. The contemporary of contemporary art is a fetish that neutralizes what is, the present in its inconsistency and incoherence, that neutralizes what is by fictionalizing the present in its own terms, idealizing the inconsistency of the present as a whole as the indeterminacy of any particular instance of art. So you would say to contemporary art, piece of contemporary art, uh, well, this is terribly indeterminate, and the artwork, the artist would say, that's just how shit is, man. That's, that's the present. It's just open-ended, right? And the artwork captures it. That's the, that's the moment of fetishization. Now this idealization, fetishization, fictionalization, idealization, this idealization of the contemporary, made by contemporary art, postulates a real that surpasses it. Which is to say the contemporary is present. So what happens within contemporary art is that it claims to it claims to capture the present and its inconsistency and so on through its indeterminacy. But because it is not the present as such, it sets up a real beyond itself, the real present, which is in fact an idealization because it's based on the fiction of indeterminacy, the fiction of the present, that is its own indeterminacy. There's a guy with it nodding, so I'm relying, <laughs> relying on you. People are keeping track. Okay. <laughs> Just keep on. Even if you don't have sense. Okay. So contemporary art then. Contemporary art <laughs> is a double idealization. Okay. It's the idealization of the contemporary, captured by the indeterminacy of the artwork, and it's the idealization of the real that it then tries to address or obtain, but it cannot because it's idealized beyond the idealization of the 
So what the metageneric limitation does is two things. It sets up the fetish of the fetish of the contemporary that is the contemporary artwork, but then it also sets up an idealized real beyond that, a super idealization, a super fictionalization, which it claims is the real. It's a double idealization. So contemporary art then uh, is a super idealization. It's a super idealism. That's in a enhanced double idealism. And this is often declared, the super idealism is often declared by people like Buffalo and so on as, as a kind of utopian possibility for the artwork. The artwork presents somehow the moment of utopia within our sorry, miserable spectacle really present. Uh, but nonetheless the artwork at least addresses it presents an index of it. But, but what we notice in these, in these characterizations of the artwork is that even as a, even as a utopia, sorry, it's not even addressed as a utopia itself. Okay, you can think of relational aesthetics as a recent bunch of this. Um, it's not actually a utopia itself, it's an index of the utopia. Okay. It's an attenuated form of utopia, a trace of the utopia, which is in fact elsewhere than here. All the discussion of things like potentiality, so on and so forth, speak to the super idealization of the real in the art. There are then two reals. Okay. We have two reals. We have a real of a doubly, the doubly idealized real of anarcho-realism. And on the other hand, we have a real that is the present without any of this idealization stuff. Okay. Without metagenerative limitation and without anarcho-realism. A real without idealization. As regards art, this unidealized real is actually existing art. It's just art that is now. And here, I think here, in this moment of unidealized, de, de idealized art, in all its modesty, because it's just art that is now, okay. here is a determination of art adequate to the contemporary. The determination of art that avoids the mistake of indeterminacy superposed on art by contemporary art as a meta genre. So I'll come to the last, the last bit of the, of the presentation, uh, which is that this then gives us uh, kind of enough to start to identify some traits and some requirements for an exit from contemporary art. So it's hard one, but eventually modest basis. We can delineate some cogent traits. We can delineate some cogent traits for an exit from contemporary art, which is to say, for an art that is adequate and specific to its time, to now, to the present. Firstly, what we have is an art that is not condemned with reference to the idealized real of an art realism. Okay? An art that is not condemned to, to uh, failing uh, in front of the super-idealism set up by anarcho-realism, or that anarcho-realism falls through. Such an art is by comparison to that demand of that maxim, unreal, insincere, inauthentic, it's artificial. If we just say art is actually existing art, and we don't refer it to a real, a more idealized real beyond it, this art is simply artificial. It's insincere, it's relative. Fake, it's inauthentic, it's, it's a bit crappy, right? actually existing art. But let's just say artificial. Avowing art, so this is something that I think we prefer, something we're left with, if we don't do the double instead of contemporary art. We get out of additional paradigm. Avowing art and its artificiality is then not to observe the anarcho realist maxim, it's not to look for a more real art somewhere else, or more real art or a truer, more sincere art somewhere else. It's real, it's just art as it is now, including what gets called contemporary art. It is not even tendentially anarchistic because it apprehends art as an institutional practice with, an, or with all the power play that involves, which then needs to be addressed as core to what counts as art, obviously, but always written out of any claim or 
the anarcho realist maxim, for example, would say all the power play about why art gets situated here and there. That, that's the reality, kind of the true, if you want, conspiratorial moment of why art is, is presented somewhere at some time. Um, all of this is not really art. Real art is beyond what comes from. No, actually existing art is that stuff, and it needs to be addressed as what art is and why it is and how it is. It's part of the judgment of what art is. In order to affirm it or to negate it. Okay? But the negation or affirmation of the artwork is also an affirmation of negation of the power play of institutions and situate that work there. I'll speak more about that next week or next time. So, again, perhaps modestly, in reality, art is a cultural and ordered practice. It's not spontaneous, expressive, or autonomous, or all the things made uh, as, a, as a kind of political, or social, or uh, cultural basis, subjective basis for art practice. Okay, here is a refer again to the quote from Eflux that I showed in the first talk, where they say, um, we can find practices of art that step outside or sit alongside its institutional, its institutional inscriptions, and that would be really where art would happen. No, that's anarcho-realism. That's the anarcho-realism, an ar an ar an and it's an idealism. We know this as Eflux is Second, so that's the first claim that we can think about art and its application. Second claim, de-idealizing the charge against the limitation of artificiality. Okay. So de-idealizing the Nardarosa reverses the residue of avant-gardeism of this charge, this countermanding of art as it is. It reverses it from saying uh, the contemporary is too artificial to fake the rest of it. Reverses it from that into a charge against the limitation of ideality. Yeah, and I think this is a knockout blow. <laughs> this, is, this is not, by comparison, a brutal picture of what you see if you Google boxing image search. Okay. There's a reversal. There's a reversal. Uh, so if you remember, anarcho-realism is a residue of avant-gardeism within the contemporary art movement. Um, and it perpetuates, in, in, in the model of contemporary art, or the paradigm of contemporary art, it perpetuates contemporary art. But if we de-idealize, if we de-idealize um, anarcho-realism, the charge against the limitation of artificiality, we can reverse, reverse this charge, accusation, into a charge against the limitation of ideality. So it becomes kind of like an auto uh, destruction of the contemporary art moment. What we complain about is not that art is not real enough, art is too idealized. Okay? That art is super idealized. Once by pretending that it's adequate, to the, that it is a figure of the present, and secondly by idealizing on top of that a real, which it falls short of art. Okay? What we do is take the anarcho realist avant-garde residue, or anarcho-realism, we take a residue of avant-gardeism, currently configured as anarcho-realism, and reverse it against the idealization that is anarcho-realism. That's what this line is. The avant-garde residue knocks out anarcho-realist ideology. So the ambition then is to look to negate post-negationary art without recourse to an idealized real. Yes. That's the affirmation. <laughs> okay, so we then have minimally two, two traits for an exit from contemporary art. The avowal of art in its artificiality, and this artificiality is the real art. That seems to me utterly uncontroversial, but actually very hard to hold on to as, as, a, as, a, as a basis and a horizon. And secondly, an art determined by post negational negation. Okay, it's a clumsy phrase, but it's the best one I could come up with. So, 
are not determined by postal negation or negation, which is said art that restitutes negation on this side of the diffusion of avant-gardism as a proliferation of differences. So contemporary art is a proliferation of differences. We can recover our negation by de-idealizing contemporary art. Okay? Now these, these would be two requirements for an exit from contemporary art. An art that restitutes negation, oh sorry, I said that. An, art, an, an exit, sorry, two requirements for an exit from contemporary art. An exit necessary, and to repeat, if art is to gain any substantial, any substantial traction on a reality, generate anything other than its self-congratulatory proliferation of differences with that best tangential relations to the real that it claims to address, which seems to me exactly what contemporary art does. Self-congratulatory proliferation of differences with that best tangential relations to the real that it claims to address. What would be a political art? An art that speaks about a political situation from which you can get a reward by being involved with the art that actually doesn't do anything in relationship to the political situation itself. It's a self-congratulatory moment. I'm being political by being involved in this political art. No, you're not. You're being involved in the proliferation of differences of contemporary art, which affirms art, but has only a tangential relationship to that political moment. If, you, if you're involved with a political because, of course, contemporary art cannot negate. It's post negation. Okay? All you can have is a, dis is, is a, is a, is a uh, alignment with a dissensual judgment, which the art would not make. That would be your, that would be your, uh, your pleasure. Okay, but an art, an art by contrast, an art exited from contemporary art, and let's for the moment call it an ex-contemporary art. Okay. An art exited from contemporary art is a practice of negating consensus and dissensus. Okay. And it has to negate both, because both consensus and dissensus, as we saw with Deleuze's reading of Duchamp, is the result of post-negation of judgments and non of art. Okay. An ex-contemporary art would be a negation of contemporary art. And such a negation is carried out by art, and so it affirms art as a power of negation. And this, I think, is another part of contemporary art. It's not quite the history of avant-gardism, because we've gone, we're currently in the post-negationary moment, which is called contemporary art. But it would restitute something of that negation of the avant-garde in the post-negation. It affirms negation. Insofar as such negations can be made on judgments, what is at issue here in the exit from contemporary art, starting where we are, because we start with the present, in its inconsistency and in its incoherence, what's, what's at issue here is the negative power of judgments. Okay. Now, this deserves, at present, still somewhat obscure formulation, and it's what I'll return to. Uh, in relationship to institutions.
wrong for me to, sim to say simply, I have a valid application, because in a way, contemporary art is doing that in a way within itself. The, the problem, the, and the, so it's extremely subtle and tricky and smart thing about contemporary art, almost as smart as the individualism. Uh, the, the, the smart thing is, is that the, the, the negation of the sense of judgment. So with contemporary art, it incorporates negation into, into art itself, because art and non art is just another moment. It's the production of the um, So the incorporation of negation of non art into art is then the proliferation of more art. So it's, it looks like it's of avant-gardeism, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's avant um, which doesn't negate art, but produces more art. So the negation generates more of the same contemporary art. It's not the same in the sense that what you're left with are then dissensual judgments, a proliferation of differences, blah, blah, blah. So you're not producing exactly the same thing. You're always interested in how one work is different to every other work in its singularity and particularity. You end up with an atomization um, constructed through indeterminacy. So, so, the, so the, the, and then, and then the indeterminacy moment is also the way in which contemporary art becomes a fetish for the present in its, in its, in the openness of the present, the inconsistency of the present. So contemporary art says, the inconsistency of the present, oh, we've got that, it's just the indeterminacy of the future, the future and the openness of judgment. That was the mistake of contemporary art, I was speaking about last week. So the problem then is uh, how to organize an exit in contemporary art, and yes, an exit because uh, I'd be interested in art that's a bit more substantially attached to the real, that does work in the real, rather than produces dissensive judgments. It seems to me consensus is not enough of a political form. Uh, and that's pretty clear to me because of where we are in politics now. Uh, so just, just to finish off the, the, the thing. So, so the problem is uh, how, to, how to recover something like a negation of art which doesn't simply fall back into the negation already incorporated into art as conceptual art, a non additional negation. Okay. So the, the, the difficulty is, okay, let me scheme to answer this way. Avant-garde, avant-garde, avant Duchamp, oh dear, no more avant-garde, because negation is incorporated within, within contemporary art. Can we have a negation after that point? Uh, and I think so. I think so. I mean, through, through this kind of the, the cartoons of the box. Um, in a way, you have to use the two moments, the anarcho realism moment and the matter generic limitation, against each other to kind of recover from the negation, which gets out of, out of the, uh, the proliferation of contemporary art as more judgments. So you want a negation which is more than just a dissension. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
You need no theory of art to love art. You, have, uh, you are in love with his artwork, with that artwork, with that artwork. Hearing, hearing that bit of the quote just made me think of the reality of not least of which contemporary American politics, actually driven by, I feel this way about this candidate or that candidate, and sort of so much of politics have actually been driven by individuated emotional thrusts, um, I suppose. And, and so much real politics that ends, that ends up getting played out by that. So it's not to say that this individual work or that individual work would be political, but, but it as a system somehow does encapsulate the contemporary well. Yeah. So, so there's a replication of conventions of now, one through the multiple history of artworks being just the inchoateness of the present, and secondly through uh, the privacy of feeling as a basis of judgment. Yeah. The second one I haven't really thought about, I think the first one I, I spoke about last week, which is um, part, part of the way in which contemporary art claims to be added to the present is precisely this inchoate proliferation. That, that, if that inchoate proliferation seems as open as the present. But my, my claim is twofold. Firstly, that there is okay, one, that it, it's, it captures that inchoateness for contemporary art seems to say, or seems to, seems to say, seems to say that it captures that inchoateness by its openness and eternity, which I think is a mistake, because even if the present is inchoate and incoherent, no one element of it need be. Okay? So we are in the present, but we are in outer space on June the 1st, on a Friday evening, grateful that we're in the That's a pretty definite determined uh, instance of the present. It's not, it's not indeterminate in a way that artwork says that it captures them. So, so that's, that's kind of let me finish this, this one point, right? So, so, so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a false identification of the openness of the present by the indeterminacy of the artworks. So you can have the proliferation of multiplicity of artworks, and that seems to kind of double the multiplicity of that identity of the present. But contemporary art, I think, says it's adequate to the present because per artwork it is as open as the present itself is. And that's why it's a fetish per artwork of the present. That's, that's the claim. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I, what I was going to interject there, but I, th I think you've clarified is that, like, yes, we are, this is one instant we're here at our space, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's like another very different sure. reality, you know, so completely, yeah, in, in concurrent to, to this, sure. and, that, and that, that's you know equally yeah. a, a specific reality. Yeah, but, but, but no, no particular amount of reality in the real or the present need to be, or I think even is determined. So the artwork. Okay, so, so the so the artworks have the indeterminacy, not the, yeah. and, and that's sort of where it falls apart. Yeah. Isn't it? Okay. Yeah, that's why it's a mistake. If the artwork said, we are as determined as everything else, which is the direction I like to push it, I think. The art, I, don't see, I don't see why the artwork cannot be as determined as everything else in the form of a proposition, uh, as clearly as a proposition as we are an artist's space and doing things in a condition group. Uh, that's a very determined proposition. Um, but, but also, the, the kind of, I think, the broader, the broader uh, interest is, well, actually, if you want to make a strong political claim, if you want to make a, a negative, positive judgment, it's a determinate judgment, not an indeterminate judgment. So for me, the, 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 in a way, the, the limitations of proscription are not meeting its, its political claims. So I think it's actually a fetish for politics, rather than politics, contemporary. Um, the, the way for it to kind of get out of this, this fetishization of the present and of, and of any claims it makes beyond just this self-congratulation, is, is to kind of have more to things. Um, so... I'm going to know the fetish. Um, so are, are you calling for an art that acts directly on the condition of the now in, in a more direct way? I mean, I, I suppose I don't mean in, 
I guess try not to revert back to rock realism, but somehow. Yeah. And, then, and you may have done this, but how would you differentiate that from rock realism? <laughs> That's the double organization thing, but okay. in a way. To, to kind of use use the residue uh, and, uh, okay, yes. <laughs> to to use to use the residue of our god as the kind of the sort of the, the, the negational the negational moment within contemporary art um, okay. to reverse it from its usual or to, to reverse it from its uh, definitional work within contemporary art as an art realist against the idealizations of contemporary art. One, against the idealization of the present through indeterminacy. And secondly, against the idealization of the real beyond the art itself. Which is, which is actually just end up with the kind of poem we say, we just, we just have actually existing art. What does it do? Actually, what does it do? Let's not make things for the art world beyond what it does. So one version of this, which is a negative formulation, not negative, like the problematic formulation, is something like, well, what is actually existing art? It's it's the current configuration of power in the art field. Some works do very well within certain power configurations. The New York would be the Chelsea Museum Collector Circuit. Um, in other words, don't do so well. That that power that power mechanism. I'll, I'll do this more next week. But the kind of power circuit is integrated into what the artwork is as actually existing. The claims of the, the way, and that's that's important to the judgment of the art. It's it's part of the artistic, it's part of the artistic moment of the art. Um, whereas I think the anarcho-realist uh, or meta-generic version of how to deal with art is just to read, to talk about art the way that we read about it through journals and through criticism and so on. We talk about the artwork in imminent terms. Formally, it recalls this, it speaks to that, it's about something else. But the power things remain outside. And if you do try and bring the power things in, it's seen as a kind of real, 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 real politique version of art, somehow divorced from the, the kind of uh, aesthetic or artistic um, operations of the artwork. Uh, the, the place where it kind of gets close is when people criticize work for being commercial. Then, in a way, there's a, there's a way in which a certain sort of style or a certain look or a certain zippiness or spectacularity of the work gets gets um, taken out commercially. In other words, it doesn't get taken commercially. I'm not convinced that there is a there is a generic sort of commercial work. Because now I think because of the reasons of um, the, the incorporated vocation that is contemporary art, anything can be happening commercially. Because it seems to me there's a problem or a, a, a commercial look. And it's also to say by contrast um, that stuff that looks commercial can't be doing interesting work. Uh, along the lines of de-idealization. Work, work that adopts traits of spectacle could be doing de-idealizing work, not de-idealizing work, but not commercial work. Should we have some questions? Is there a microphone? Yeah, thank you for your um, getting to the conclusion. Although you went very fast, it was very hard to take notes on the, the, the slides in the last session. Um, um, two questions I have to I wanted to pursue further. Um, the implications of uh, I wanted to open that, those up, and maybe we do that in later work uh, or the next talk. But the implications of de-idealizing the charge against the limitation of artificiality. Does that then put us in the position of what used to be called by you know, Greenberg and other modernists as veering into theatricality? That is to say, are we, if we're opening into artificiality, if we embrace artificiality, or are you simply suggesting that we need to begin to, let's say, break through the fear, or rather, break through the or explore the boundaries of this limit of artificiality is the first step. I mean, indeed, I would agree that the, this kind of super idealist realism of contemporary art has a tremendous totemic taboo against anything more artificial. There's this 
insane fetish for um, this kind of uncanny realness. Um, so would it be the first step that the, the breakthrough would need to be at um, giving a finger to that and then essentially saying we embrace the artificial? And then does that bring us too close to the campiness or to you know some of the strategies that were kind of employed in the 60s at different points? Yeah. These are further questions. I'm opening this kind yeah, of yeah, no, yeah. It's good. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's important to kind of get some, some sort of concrete sense of what, what this means. Um, uh, in a way, it's a, it's a very modest claim, which is art is artificial. It's, it's straightforward. I mean, that's, that's what art is, it's artificial. The, it's, so it's, it's more about the internal, the, internal the, the, the judgments and determinations of what that artificiality amounts to, what it does within the art field. So even, even for, uh, for example, uh, if, if there's a sense, let's, let's say political work, art that's actually political, where is, the, where is the politics of that work? Well, it's outside of the art work. Okay? It's in reference to I saw a show recently which was about alternative economies. The politics, the reality of the politics would be outside the work itself, which the work points to, um, and through the economy or something like that. What's left out is the work itself is doing some politics in relationship to the economy by, by virtue of where it's situated. That's its reality. But a reality constructed by the artifice that is the work itself. Right? So that in a way, the political moment of the artwork is predicated on, on uh, affirming its artificial presentation as an artwork. So we have to think about that artificiality. That would take it away from the genres of artificiality, such as campus or theatricality and so on. In a way, what, what um, Greenberg, and maybe more strongly with Freed, what they were doing in the 60s, early in the 60s, uh, in the, the complaint around theatricality was, yes, a complaint against artificiality uh, in order to get back to some moment of well, with freedom of social. Right? Um, but in a way that, that that's that's a that's a uh, a claim appropriate to the concerns of the time. But it's also a kind of avant-garde thing, I think. Yeah, at that time. That in a way what art what art had become or what he was struggling with was I guess a version of art which would have been very uh, uh, to do with subjective judgment, to do with where, 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 where a view is placed, uh, and also as a complaint against minimalism. That that what one was actually this is quite complex. So maybe maybe I, I should uh, I should go too much into details. It seems like a challenge. Um, I, for, for me, the key thing around artificiality would not be to to restrict it to a style, theatricality, happiness, um, spectacle, something like this. It's more to do with the, the fact of art, of, the art, of art being artificial. And that, that it's, so the, so the artificial is not contrasted to natural, to real. That in a way, the reality of art is that it's artificial. It can't be more real than that. And if, if we try and set up a, a, something more real than that, to, in a way, if you want, incorporate Art into the social to make it a social practice without artificiality, to organize it within common practices, to make it political in a way that's not artificial, not an artificial politics, but a real politics. That's the mistake. That's the idealization of what art is. But, but in, a, in two things. One, it seems to me that the second, which is to say that art isn't really artificial, it belongs to all these other things. And, can be absorbed into them and judged against them are the standard kinds of contemporary art. Uh, and in a way, the more pressing, dissential forms of contemporary art. Um, and secondly, it's actually a very modest claim. I'm not saying anything, I'm just stating the obvious, which is this stuff is completely artificial. So with the show upstairs, um, by walking around with a stick into shows and stuff, it's a moment of artifice that constructs the, constructs the movie. Let's not, let's not look over the artifice of that move in order, in relationship to what it sets up and generates. Let's not try to absorb it within a larger scheme. 
which would somehow naturalize it as a point of you know, late 60s conceptualism and the way that that has just become our our, our repair and our also those conceptual practices. So, so in a way, it's, it's kind of it's, it's kind of beginning with beginning with the with the um, with the fact that the real thought is its antithesis. But that's not a style. That's that's an interventionary intervention. And also, let's not be embarrassed about that. It is an artificial intervention. So, but that seems to me 
perfectly good for thinking about art because it deals with representations all the time. But that's that's you know the, the issue would be to not think about uh, the communications of the artwork are anything but performative, qua institutionalized moves, yeah. qua institutionalized statements, or representative, qua idealized or natural or natural um, non non uh, non mediated articulations. They are only institutional gestures and mediated mediated communications. But representation, right? that's where art actually works. The, the problem with the contemporary art movement and anarcho realism and someone with a meta generic limitation, which I accept is not a great term, which I should work hard on. But it was, yeah. the, the problem with these terms is, is um, the problem with anarcho realism and meta generic limitation is that they try and look past these artifices to, in a way, what the work is doing which would be somehow a, 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 a moment of communication beyond the representation. And I say, well, if we wanted to think about art and its artificiality, we were, we, we have the representation. You know, I think, I think artists everywhere understand this, this is what they talk about all the time. Um, but the issue would be how, and again, it's, it's, it's actually a very modest, very modest and straightforward thing, the content of the artwork depends on the representation of the formative. So the, 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 what the representation is of the content changes what the artwork is. And it's actually exactly what art is up to. The question is why that doesn't get addressed in those terms. It gets turned into other things like a move to find out what the, the real communication thing is. Or what the indeterminate moment where you're left to make your own way through the art, why that's the true, why the subjective take home, your, your own understanding of the work, why that's the true moment of the art work now for us in contemporary art. So if, if just so, and I'm proud of that, but just, just this, this final sort of point, uh, the, if, if the artwork sets itself up, I think this came, this came to me uh, through, through spending a lot of time teaching artists, thinking about content in relationship to forms of presentation, representation of forms of, just that struggle. Um, the artwork gets shown. It's actually that's not actually what, what the take home is for the work. The take home is a subjective judgment. And that stuff gets left behind. In a way, all of that is just construction for a judgment, which is a subjective aesthetic judgment. Um, and I think the demand is to push back to 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 go back to that struggle between representation and content. Or what I would call artificial. Aggressive because of these slides, maybe, but um, I think just. <laughs> <laughs> you, you chose that. Yeah, I, I know the critique about boxing and masculinity. So. <laughs> um, uh, it doesn't have to be aggressive, it can be, it can be subtle or nuanced. Um, I'm not it's saying. Like yeah, it's aggressive. <laughs> um, I, it doesn't have to be aggressive, it can be non aggressive, but I think it's determined. It's fixing. One is the, the claim I was making 
Um, towards the end, I appreciate that. Quite fast, given the complexity of the programs. Um, but it's all on video on the Artist Space website, so you can replay it <laughs> at your own pace. Um, thanks, Artist Space. Uh, so the, the, the claim. Um, I think somewhere was that the art, contemporary art stylizes indeterminacy within itself. So the artwork puts itself up as a proposal, which says, what, 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 what would you make? I'm not going to tell you what this was really about, but you figure out for yourself. So everyone had their interpretations, and that's the discussion we should have. And that's what artwork does, it kind of soft democratizing practice. Democratizing practice. Um, that's 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 really, that's a sort of stylization of indeterminacy, and it's also a stylization of the larger things. Um, so the the fixing is in relationship to that. That rather than a rather than proposal, very much making other things. It's a it's a definite proposition. Not of the way you want to judge things, but like how art proposes something that is determined. Well, the, the first move, the first move, which I think is incumbent upon art, not just I mean, I'm talking about through artworks, but this is also actually I see this happening. I think curators are doing this more than artists. They put forward a definite proposal. Okay, the curator seems to me, not all curators, no? but the curator you see more definite proposals than you see in uh, Because the curator seems less of a big didactic than, than artists. Uh, so the, 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 the first thing would be a more determinate type of artwork, which proscribes the aesthetic judgment, the, the kind of deduvian, champion, this is art judgment. Because that would be the issue of no, it's not like this is art. We know this is art because of the institutional frameworks. That's part of it. Or we would make a claim that something is art, even if it falls outside of this institutional frameworks on another basis. That would demand consent. Okay? That's a political move around what counts as an art and counts as specific. So the first, the first moment, in this, in this fable is, is um, the determinacy of the artwork. The second is that the judgment made is a determinate judgment, not an aesthetic judgment. Okay. It's a judgment with knowledge, it's a judgment with criteria. But, but that, that's, also, that's also a move that gets made in and around and through the power structures in which the artwork is presented. Pursuing powers of everything. Okay? So, so the, the task then, and this is, this is what I want to get into the next talk, I guess. Um, the task then, and this is why I'm interested in negation as well, because if the judgment that needs to be affirmed in this legacy, I guess, from the modern as a place to have a street contemporary art into an exit contemporary art, is negation, the negative part of judgments. It can't be judgments that simply affirm what is now. They have to negate what is now. Okay. That's why it's not fixing institutions. So, so the determinacy of the artwork, the determinacy of the judgment, can be used to unfix. Okay. So you, you need, you need, and I think this is kind of good, good politics for me. I mean, not, it depends on the content, of course, but strong occupy. Okay. What does occupy do? It says no. It's a negative judgment. Okay. Um, and it's very specific. There's no, there's no question of what it's occupied about. It's very clear what it's saying. No to neoliberalism, no to finance, order, ruling, government, and the okay. um, it's, a, it's a fixed, determined judgment, um, and it does something very specific in the political field and in relationship to itself as a movement. Um, and it seems to me that, that that's not necessarily trying to keep things in place. It's actually trying to negate what is it. But it comes up the determinacy of its judgment, the fixity of its judgment. If it was just say, yeah, what do you think? We can have a process and say, what do you think? What do you think? Then, then it just could have do what it does. Yeah. Um, my question is the same line like this. Um, it's, for me, would be interesting to understand uh, what you mean by um, by saying that um, the judgment has the art judgment, the post the post um, exit art um, 
has to establish its criteria. Criteria. It is a criteria has to be. It has to be. It has to be known. If I understand you in the right way. And my question is, um, when you criticize um, the contemporary art, um, there is a problem of um, interdisciplinarity in contemporary art, which you, which you could say this is a uh, the, the Duvian point of view. And, um, and today there is this incredible um, insecurity in the art world. Incredible. Insecurity. Insecurity. Institutional, I call it institutional insecurity in uh -huh. the I mean, the art world, if, if you go to a gallery show, you can be sure that you never know how to, how to um, judge an art world. Sure. Because you always have other discourses sure. around it. And um, so my question is, um, how can you establish um, a kind of criteria, system of criteria in the system of art? No, this, this is... This is uh why well, I keep on reiterating the introductory comments because I mean, an added problem with the way I'm answering the questions as well because I'm always going to the artwork. But when I speak about art, I think in all of this, when I speak about contemporary art, it's not simply the artwork, it's the, it's the infrastructure and the system. Okay? So, contemporary, I think, I think this argument is not simply around artwork. There's one moment where I talk about artworks in corpus, stylizing in tendency. But you can see that as well in the rest of you can see that in art criticism, you see it in the catalog essays, you see it in the power discourses um, of the dealers, the galleries, the collectors, and so on. Right? Uh, so I think this argument, this post negation of the art, is systemic, not just around the artworks. So if there are to be criteria, the entire field has to be, has to be negated in its post negation practice. And, and so the criteria could emerge from yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, here are two criteria. These are definite criteria, and I'll stick by them. And let's 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 look at any moment of art discourse in relationship to these two criteria. Okay, I have criteria, so I can set them up. But an artist could set up definite criteria, or uh, a curator and so on. So, in a way, it, the, the issue is we can't have criteria until we exit contemporary art because contemporary art is the field of openness, what you call insecurities. Okay, but I would call it indeterminacy, uncertainties, ambivalences, so on and so forth. We can't have criteria unless we exit the field. The question is how do you exit the field? And it's actually quite a hard thing to do. The quick way to do it is just to stop making art and get out of art altogether. Lots of people do that. Uh, but that seems to me then just to let the field continue in its post negation practice. Okay. So the problem with leaving the field is, of course, that leaving the field is to negate, but that's not the field. So that's, that's the kind of overall logic of this tool. Uh, so the, the, the kind of the criteria to be set up uh, would, you know, it's a political question whether we can set up the criteria or not. And in a way, it's for us now if people want to leave the field, to set up the criteria and to find out what they are. But there are lots of things invested in that and different claims and interests and so on. It's a political in a strong sense. It would be a political question. And political also because um, there's lots of interests and reasons to not be contemporary. Art. People do very well that. And, it, and indeterminacy suits, indeterminacy, indeterminacy suits uh, it's, it's cozy and it's self congratulatory because you can do stuff and you leave it open and I'll do it. You may not do well out of it, but the harder thing is to make definite claims, which is to say you set up criteria for success of failure, the other claims, and to uh, be rewarded or not rewarded on that basis. This is, sorry, Jack? In response to that last question, just, I'm just I'm wondering if you if it's too much of a stretch to think about this larger project of contemporary uh, exiting contemporary art. You mentioned neoliberalism before, and I I keep thinking about that sort of parallel, like the the sort of the trap, the the 
wants to have an insatiable appetite at near the moment it can be that any negation of it, it, it subsumes and, and sort of uses for its own um, cool factor. Um, and it seems contemporary, it seems a, in many ways a parallel to that dynamic. Would you consider parallel, paralleling the argument onto something like neoliberalism or, or larger political um, context in some way? Um, I, I, I follow Boltanski and Kipella, which is to say that for me the absorption of criticism doesn't seem to be specific to neoliberalism but about capitalism, of which neoliberalism is kind of prevailing form for you know, the, the West. Maybe globally. So, so we would be on capitalism in Germany. Um, so the, there's a there's a kind of similar absorption moment. Um, the the uh, around the other reason specifically, I think there is a connection insofar as what one is left with. This comes back to the criteria. So the criteria point. If there are no common criteria, and all one is left with is I love art, or this is art, for the world. What you're left with is a kind of series of subjective judgments, which are aesthetic judgments to do with artwork and what kinds of dissensual judgment and so on, which evacuates power, the power of the sociological trait, the sociological place of the one who says, this is art. And as we know, if there are no criteria, how do you organize a public culture? How do you organize a culture for a public? Which, which means a, a consensual, it's not consensual, maybe not consensual, but that there are common criteria. That would be a common criteria. Yeah. Um, if there are no criteria, then and all the other things is individualized judgments, then you come to something like um, uh, the primacy of individual judgments, not on the artwork, and, and also the power of certain people who say this is art against other people who say the rich and those in big institutions have much more power when they say this is art than those who have no power or very little power and don't live in big institutions. Okay. So the corollary or the, the, the thing that's left out of the Deus argument has to be left out of because it's because it's around the, the aesthetic judgment without criteria. Um, is the power of it to say this is art. But there are enormous power things and we know it. Now, if there are no criteria for us all to say, well, this judgment may say this is our power, but according to these criteria, we have to leave that judgment out of place because we, we think there should be uh, art for in common, or that there should be an avant garde which matters more than whether part of people like, um, like certain types of art and so on and so forth. If those criteria aren't, aren't available, then it can just become about the power of the judgments of the most powerful being the judgments that are the most powerful judgments. So there's a kind of, there's a way in which the power moment um, becomes influential in terms of a centralization of what counts as our practice. When the history of the period is written, it will be determined strongly by the establishment of major collections by people who do well at the moment. Because the public, there's no public criteria. Follow the criteria established here mm -hmm. as number one. Mm -hmm. They have been proposals that one or pretend to be the same. No relation studies. No relation studies. Or, or just as an example. Yeah, no, but this, this. I mean, October supports very specific type of work. No, that is not, not October either. That is no, I mean, very quickly, relation studies not because it sets up things micro utopias in the sort of immediate sort of environment that it sets up. As a relation without external environment. But this is, a, this is an idealism. It's absolutely an idealism. Because it excludes the conditions in the determination of what's happening with that work, excludes how that work comes to be in that place. And also it sets up the real sociality outside of the artificial work as a construction of the artificiality of the work. But what matters about relation aesthetics is the real sociality, which is not the artificiality of the work. Right? So it falls precisely into the contemporary art moment. Not October, because what they set up 
or it's a heterogeneous, relatively heterogeneous crowd. But insofar as they are relatively homogeneous as well, what they ascribe to, I did this, I spent a lot of time in this stuff, heavily crystallized afterwards if you like so much more to uh, rightly, uh, because I should be criticizing them uh, on the same ground. Uh, the 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 utopia buffs are committed to utopia. I, art is a utopian practice. I mean, certainly the major figures, um, but also the, the second, third, gen third, fourth generation. They're all interested in utopian practices. The artificial of art, the artificial art, the artificial art of art is in the name of the utopia, which is the super art of right. So I, I, and we could go through contemporary art daily. I, okay, I mean, we could do this later as a, as a pub game. Right. Let's just go to any, any declaration in any institution, in any practice, you will find this in the or the super idealism. This is this is this is not what of contemporary art is. Either artworks or as institution practices or what's expected of art. And and this serves this serves a certain power play. There was a one of those oh. the, the, So, yeah, I, I was thinking about that, what she said, about bringing out relational aesthetics, because like, then Claire Bishop talks about the quality of the yeah. relational aesthetics, and then though she then sets up something, and then some other administrator picks some performance artist from another country and determines, oh, this is the supreme sensational political aesthetics for politics or his politics. You know, the context of you know, an art institution being challenged by this contradictory politics. So those are negations working against one another, correct? Based on what you're saying. So these are a series of exits from contemporary art, but they're going back into contemporary say. So what do you say about that? I didn't quite get the clear bishop to, to institutions picking up artists from. From curators that are sort of, that have been courting these artists, uh, particular artists that are working outside, that have exited contemporary art, but they're being brought back into contemporary art by their critique of the institution and Depends, it depends, I, I mean, in a way, the, the, those practices of pragmatics sort of look after themselves in a way. I think the issue would be what are the claims made and how, how, is, how does the work set itself up? Right? So we have to look specifically at the rhetorics of the work, but also the rhetorics of the claims around the work. And it's, it seems to me that if, if the claims around the work, the discourse of this, this criticism and so on, are rely upon condition of indeterminacy, and if the work itself is also somewhat indeterminate, what do you make of this? Then it falls into the contemporary art model. So I can't, I mean, I can't address sort of, in a way, that pragmatic chain. But it seems to me, maybe when Claire Bishop says quality, and I think she still leaves it fairly undecided, what she means is something like aesthetic, aesthetic criteria. So we can't think about the, the, the success of an artwork which is simply on its social function. We also have to think whether it's interesting art or not. And a name for that, whether it's interesting art or its quality. Um, it doesn't seem to me she says what that would be. But my guess is, in looking at the work that she allows, what she's interested in is something at least like deep ambivalences, open-endedness, and so on. The problem with Work that's simply socially functioning, or you know, that gets that gets um, understood to be successful according to whether it has real social outcomes, it gets instrumentalized. So the aesthetic criteria is a kind of anti-instrumental play within an anti-instrumental play within the social function moment. But that anti-instrumentality is not another way of speaking about indeterminacy, okay. because because instrumentality means a kind of fixing, a kind of use. 
a specific, a specific claim uh, which has criteria, which it either succeeds or fails to it. I'm, I'm quite interested in, through this argument, thinking about instrument, instrumentality as a form of art. Art practice is the instrumentality. It seems to me that that's what I have to start kind of getting into. And actually have instrumentality as a condition for art. To replace oh, the materiality of the artificiality. No, 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 no. It's instrumentality, uh, instrumentality uh, on the basis of artificiality. Okay. Instrumentality against against the kind of uh, aesthetic judgment or against uh, the contemporary art. Stays on the side of 
what happens within the art field, but actually, uh, and then there's a kind of a sort of distance or attainment thing to, to a reality sometimes. If, if the effort here for an exit from the art is to have real traction outside of the art field, then the next part of judgments, which I'm looking for a relationship to, has to extend outside of the art field. Okay. So, so around these practices, they may be instrumental and determined and specific and so on and so forth. The question is, do they do, 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 do that have a relationship to the real? My guess not, because they're trying to do something for a community and affirm it. The question is whether what they do for the community negates something else. I think we might actually have to wrap this up <laughs> soon. Um, okay. But um, please come back for our final installment on June 14th. It will be much shorter because it's going to be two respondents, uh, Tita, so Lahada, and David Joseph. So it will be very short. <laughs> thank, thank you so much to have a